I'm Anfar from Anfemzer.com and LZW is back. I know you missed me. <laughs> it's been a year or more since the first episode of LZW. So a lot of things have changed. I've got notes about everything that changed and I'm gonna try find my, huh, yes, find my notes so I can read you out everything I should. So the thing is, I've totally changed the concept of LZW. The initial concept was that I will be making tracks, recording full footage of how do I do it, explaining every step. But the big mistake was that I tried um, first to make one big video of every track uh, and throwing everything in, like I do kick drum in, I do bass, I do slit synth, I do mixing, I do some other stuff, everything in one video. That was not a good idea because this knowledge is just mixed up and it's hard to find what you really need and you ha actually have to watch everything, which is daunting and just pointless. So first thing uh, to change is that no more long, boring uh, videos, like 45 minutes of me doing some track, actually do going super fast with my uh, VX Nano uh, Logitech mouse. No, uh, instead, uh, I'm going to go with short episodes, one topic for each episode, detailedly covered. All right. So one episode for making a kick drum, one episode for making a snare drum, one episode for making a bass sound type A sound, bass sound type B, five of them or pads, etc. All right, so this is the introductionary video. I have actually, um, you can take a look. Where's my mouse? Oh yeah, here it is. I have a list uh, of episodes and the numbers and so you have I have plans for making these videos it's a quite a lot content uh, but I think it's going to be easier to make uh, because of the second reason and the second thing that I did wrong last time is that I wanted to go full HD 60 FPS uh, multiple Super cool stuff like A candy, I candy, animations, cool transitions, you know, like in uh, equals free, <laughs> cool transition, yeah, that kind of stuff. So I focus too much on, on making this visually attractive instead of making it um, just packed with good knowledge. So I regret that. I I saw. I'm sorry. I'm going to. Um, make the second change, which is I'm going 640 by 480, no animations and cool stuff, you know, just a little bit, you know, maybe a jingle at the start. Uh, so I can get 30 FPS instead of 15 on, on the, for the recorded footage and no post-processing editing, which means I spend five hours on making an episode instead of uh, 30 minutes. So I get more motivated to make episodes when it doesn't take five days to accomplish one episode. Okay, let's see what do I have. What should I do next? Okay, less quality, more content. Yeah. Short episodes. Yeah. Mm, yes. Okay. So another news, not regarding LZW, which stands for LMMS and Zenit SubFX Watch and Learn. Another news is about LMMS itself. Uh, LMMS has got a new version. As you're gonna see, uh, LMMS is now in version 1.0.0. So, uh, a lot of Changes have happened since the f beginning of the year. There are a few new synths. Uh, there is a totally different look. There are some improvements, some features that are, were missing for a long time, uh, like cool automation that can you know do 
this type of thing or even this type of thing where you can actually have you know a curve with control points not just uh, discrete automation with samples all right so LMMS has got a new version that's another news um, what's more well if you don't have it already get it at lmms.sf.net which stands for SourceForge. Actually, the development of LMMS have moved to GitHub, so if you are interested in helping us out, finding bugs, um, taking screenshots of what's broken and uploading them, go to github.com slash LMMS, and there you will find the project. Uh, you can find my bug reports as well, because I'm involved in developing this program since the beginning of the year. Actually, I was one of the persons involved in giving LMS the new energy to carry on, and I decided to just kick these guys in the butt and say, hey, this is awesome. You can't waste this. I mean, this is an amazing program. We just need to do something with it. And they did, and we did all together, and it's moving forward really fast and improving on many fields, parts. All right, uh, I'm getting... <sighs> it's getting long. But anyway, I wanted to pack one more big thing into this uh, initial episode. For those of you who are not familiar with Zenat SubFX interface, I'm going to do a overview and a detailed overview <laughs> or a review of what is what, what is where, and what does what, so you can tame this beast and make some cool sounds out of it, because it's worth it. All right, so let's get it on. I'm going to hide this crappy, shitty stuff. Um, let's just hide it somewhere, like this. All right. So, let's begin with taming LMMS. I'm going to remove the kicker, which is a default instrument right now. And I'm going to input some note. Maybe we will get use of it, maybe not. Let's see. So, here's the beginning. Um, we have the plugin tab for the instrument. We have the big button Show GUI, which opens up LMMS graphical interface, user interface. We have a few knobs here down below, which are rooted to some global controls of Zenit SubFX. This is port for portamento, so we can control with automation within LMMS the time of portamento effect we can control all filter frequencies, so we can, you know, just tilt, tilt them up or bend them down or reset it, do some automation. We can also have resonance for filters. We can rise the Q value or lower it to make the filters less sharp. Uh, we have bandwidth for things like uh, filtering out from a noise, we can actually make this wider so it's more noisy and less tone-like. We have also frequency modulation gain. Uh, this affects FM synthesis, so all frequency modulation, actually frequency modulators within this patch are going to be affected and we can, you know, just make them gentle or not. We have also resonance center frequency, I don't know what this does, and resonance bandwidth. Uh, nobody knows. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Okay, forward MIDI control changes. I guess this have some use, I don't use it. Anyway, this is all we have to know for the start. So now let's open GUI. We have a window right here. 
So this is the main Zenit SubFX window. And it looks pretty nice. However, you may have no idea what this stuff is. I'm gonna show you. It's broken up into several panes, several categories. Uh, of course, on the top, on top, we have the main menu. We have file, we can create a new patch, uh, just clearing out everything. We can open some patch, we can save it. Um, actually, uh, Zenit SubFX have two ways of saving and loading patches. One is through many file, and it's called open parameters and save all parameters. And this creates a um, XMZ file. So it's like um, master settings. And we have the same thing in instrument, which is open and save instrument, which is thus XIZ, which is instrument. So we can save individual instrument or all settings. And why why this and what is the difference? Well, we have... Uh, actually, Zenit SubFX is a multi-timbral synth and it has 16 parts. So when you click on this panel window button here, we have something that looks very much like a mixer. And it is a mixer. We have 16 channels. By default, they are assigned to 16 MIDI channels. So when this round, so when Zenit SubFX runs as a standalone application, you can just connect 16 keyboards to your laptop, uh, assign each one to a different MIDI channel and perform 16 different instruments at the same time within one um, within one instance of Zenit SubFX, which is cool. Now, why would we need this? Sometimes we run out of um, mixing capabilities. I mean, I made a sound that it's heavy, gritty, nice, cool, but I need to add some elements to it. And I'm out of voices in, in different synthesizers, engines and stuff. So I just open up another part, assign it to the same first MIDI channel, and I have the same thing. You know, we can click edit here, or here, and it should open us uh, this window. It doesn't. I don't know why. Never mind. So we can have 16 different instruments. I'm going to disable it for now. Of course, we have volume and pan controls. So we can um, adjust the sounds, the proportions of the sounds. So it's an internal mixer of Zenit SubFX. So every part will jump to the lower pane. This is the higher pane. This is all master settings. We have master volume here, which is the last fader before this plugin output signal. We have master key shift. So we can transpose this by octave up, two octaves up, two octaves down, etc. We can also do this by single keys, but I never use that. We have also global fine detune, which we can, you know, just defer the tuning. If for some reason we want to detune the whole thing, we can do it. And there's a reset detune button, which brings us to 64, uh, in case we can't uh, get it right because it takes some, you know, practice. Oh, one tip. Uh, you can manipulate knobs in Zenit SubFX in two ways. You can do it with left mouse button, press and drag it down or up. Dragging left or right doesn't do anything. So you click, drag up or down if you want to change the value up or down, etc. But you can also do this with right mouse button. And right mouse button gives you extra precision. So it's like 10 times more precise. 
you know, here, I'm to the bottom of the scale, and with right click, the screen is not enough to get to the bottom of the scale here. All right. Also, uh, this is not useful when you're doing it in LMMS, but as a standalone application, ZenSubFX also has an audio recorder. You can select from many, record, choose WAV file, and opens up a file dialog. You can type anything, but not in a user bin. Sorry. Yes, I'm typing tiled test.vav. Hit enter. And now the rec button uh, is enabled. I can press it, it starts recording. You can see that the record has this asterisk now and it's disabled, but I can place something on my virtual keyboard. Or can I? Yes, I can. Beautiful harmony. Yeah, and this gets recorded to the file. I can pause it, I can stop it. So the file now should be there. Yes, it is. And now we even see that riff. Yep, it's a WAV file. Okay. Um, so what do we have more? We have a panic button. Panic. If you have sounds, like you got the keyboard, and you press a few keys, and then you switch the window, and the keys are pressed back there, but you can't unclick them, you can just press panic button, and it sends off, note off. For on all channels, for all notes, it disables all playing sounds. This is useful if you, you know, just create a patch that goes insane and totally uncontrollable, and you can just kill it. It has a bomb embedded, and you can detonate this beast when it's out of control with panic button. Okay, panel window, we already reviewed that. It's the internal mixer. Vicky, VK, virtual keyboard. You have this little MIDI controller built in, which has a few cool things. First, it has a middle cha MIDI channel. You can see that the 10 MIDI channel, 10th MIDI channel is drum. So I guess it's uh, something for, you know, internal velocity. You can set the velocity of the keys because this is, of course, non-pressure sensitive. The, um, the vertical mouse uh, position doesn't affect the volume as it does within LMMS. As you can see, if I press the key here, it's louder when I pr than when I press it here. So this is what LMS does, but ZenSubFX does it differently. Okay, we have velocity randomness. So we can have each note a slightly different velocity. It, it might add some life to our performance if we do it with a mouse or QWERTY keyboard. Octave. shifts the whole thing in frequency. Now we have two blocks, QR and ZXCV. QR is the top. Q, W, E, R, T, Y, U, I, O, P. Left bracket, right bracket, and backslash. So it's Q is C, W is D, E is A, E is E, actually E is itself. R is F, and for example, two is sis, while three is this, or D sharp, C sharp, D sharp, etc., or D flat, E flat, as you prefer. So this is the top row, and we have the bottom row, starting with Z as C. So I'm pressing the Z key, and it plays the C note lower. S is C sharp, D is D sharp, X is D, etc. You figure it out. So we have the two rows and they are controlled independently. So you can shift every row wherever you want. So now under Z I have so sub bassish C. 
that it shakes ground. I'm going to turn up the whole thing so you can hear it. Listen up. This is the sound of Armageddon. While Q plays a much higher note. All right. This is it. Now we have controller. We can filter. Uh -huh, no. We can pick what parameter is controlled by this slider right here. It might be filter. Or it might be portamento. No. Panning. Yeah, so we have a mouse, uh, you can, you know, play, perform stuff like this, uh, just like <sighs> Whittler does. And finally, we have a pitch wheel. I'm gonna play a note. And the reset button very useful thing. So we have a pitch wheel, you can bend this and press reset. All right, close this. Virtual keyboard, done. Now we have scales. Now this is something extremely weird because you can actually make Zenit sub effects play in any microtonal system you would ever could ever come up with. By default, it's 12 notes per octave, equal temperament. And this is its um, configuration, and you can change this. I highly recommend don't mess with this thing, because unless you're into some microtonal music, I'm not, I'm not touching this. However, you can also, you know, um, change the tuning, because we have, you know, 440 hertz, here and you can switch it, shift it to 400, uh, 438, you know, you can just do this to thousandth of a hertz. This is much, much precision and stuff. You can also invert the keyboard, but will play, you know, higher keys will play lower notes and such. It's weird. You can also import and export, uh, no, just import. Yes, keys from different things. All right, I'm going to disable this, close it, forget about it. Don't you ever touch that thing. Okay, so this was the top pane of the main Zenit SubFX window. Are you still here? Still living? Hey, let me show your, show me your face. No, I don't have your face. Never mind. Okay, so let's go to the bottom pane. Forget about the middle pane. Middle pane right now. I'm going right to the bottom pane, which starts here. So on the very bottom, of course, we have a VU meter, which prints out the volume. Okay. We have we see that we have pan or pan slightly messed up because we have one decibel difference in left and right channel. Uh, what this does? Well, it shows you what is the level loudness level of the signal output after the main fader. So the basic rule is generally try to not overload it over or zero decibels but actually it doesn't matter you can overload it anyway and it won't distort unless you have a limiter on the master or you will export a 32-bit floating point WAV file this box here displays uh, the highest peak ever reached if you can you can reset this by clicking with your mouse and if actually if I actually quickly create some envelope for this you can see that it really does what it is intended to do okay 
So the blue bars are the digital peaks, whether the yellow um, bars <laughs> are RMS values. So this is the, you know, perceived loudness for short. If you don't know what's RMS and digital peak, go search Wikipedia. Wikipedia. Okay, I'm going to stop the sound because it doesn't make explaining e any easier. <laughs> yes, I know it's hard and it's difficult, but if you want to master Zenit SubFX, you have to be strong, man. And really, it's worth it. So stay with you. Stay, stay here. Okay. So the lower pane, we started with the meter. It's done. Now, in the left corner, we have the part number. So here we can switch up to sixteenth, all parts. And you can see that they are grayed out because they are disabled. And you can enable them here, etc. Also, here is a bar. You can right click it to change the name of the patch of the instrument. So we can say it's um, thing. Ta da! Now you have this. But only in part one. Part two can be different thing. And no, it should be a different thing. If you left click this, you open up a patch browser where you have all the categories. Actually, they are doubled. Uh, LMMS somehow doubled them. All the categories of stuff. Uh, and you can create your new banks. Uh, you can save your presets here, but uh, in LMMS, uh, we're not really going to use this. It's a very cool thing if you're doing if you're doing live stuff uh, or performing with Zenith SubFX as a native instrument. <laughs> Not to confused, not to be confused with native instruments, a company. But uh, if you're using it within LMS, you probably want to store your presets as LMS presets, XPF files. So I'm going to close this, and we have a thing and a different thing. I'm going to disable the different thing and stay with the thing. Yep, yeah, right click changes the name. Also, when you have edit instrument here which is a very important button, you have two fields. You can name yourself by an SASA. Ha ha ha. Never mind. You can also write something to people who are going to be using your patch how to use it, why not to use it, etc. So this is the Edit Instrument button. And here we have three engines. engines. If you didn't know, Zenith SubFX have three, has three different synthesis engines. Our engines. Everyone works on a different principle, but they have some similar blocks. I'm going to go and talk about them just in a while, but I'm going to finish the the pain first here. All right, so <sighs> every patch has a volume knob, of course, a pan knob, of course, you know what this does. However, please note that Zenith SubFX have inverted pan. So when you turn it right, it will actually sound more left. Yes, I'm not swapped I haven't swapped the channels. If you hear this in the right speaker, you're wrong. And the meter is also wrong. As you can see, that the lower more, most of the times is displaying the right channel. And shows like the right channel is much louder. Well, actually, it's the left channel. So they are swapped. So it's like the global output of Zenith SubFX is swapped left, right. So keep this in mind, or you will get very confused. It's not actually a problem, but you have to know this. I don't know, maybe they will fix this eventually. 
All right, so we have pan, we have velocity sensing function. You know what's velocity sensing? The harder you press the key, the louder the note. However, if you turn this all the way up, it doesn't matter how loud is the note. It will always sound the same. You see, we have three notes of completely different volumes and they all sound the same. However, if I turn this down, they are starting to sound different. Also, there's a velocity offset. So it's like you have a function that's a straight line. Actually, do I have a my paint? I have. I'm gonna paint it. So if you have a function, no oh my, not this one. Yep. You know what is a function? And we have uh, x. <laughs> oh my, no, please. It's gonna be y. And y. No, x and y. So we have a y and x. So the function of the volume is that input and output, actually. So y is the input, x is the output. And we have a center point somewhere. And it's a, you know, you can tilt this thing. If you turn, if you turn the, uh, the volume sensitivity knob down, you get this. You mean every level of the input is the same level of the output. And you have the velocity offset, which means you can offset this to this, for example. Or you can have some extra sensitive curve that it's going to be like this and somewhere there, never knows. And you can offset this. It's you actually offsetting it vertically, but it looks like you're offsetting it horizontally because this function actually never ends. So it's this type of thing. Yeah, it's controlling a function. So you have velocity sensitivity and velocity offset. This controls the changes of the volume regarding the changing volume, the changing pressure of your keys, of your keystrokes. Sorry for the volume, so the water notes, noises. I need to drink. All right, we have key shift. So every patch, every part can be key shifted. 12 is an octave, of course. So this is an octave up. 12, two octaves up, three, etc. Also, a MIDI channel, which is receiving this part, is receiving notes from and in another information. We can set this up in the panel window, of course, as well, here. Now, we have the Edit Instrument button, which is very important, um, and we have a few more things. First, we have the mode, poly, mono, or legato. Actually, legato could be right, could be written mono legato. Do you know how this differ? If you don't know, I'm gonna tell you. Polyphonic sims can play multiple notes at once. So, if you open up a keyboard, like this, you can press, oh my god. I have a bug. When I press the keyboard, it's randomly restarting notes. It's wicked. Anyway, I'm gonna do it with this. This is a major chord. A monophonic synth wouldn't be able to play a chord. Because it would be able to play only one note. As you can hear, 
it's playing only one note. However, there's also a mono legato thing. So how does the mono legato and mono thing differ? I'm gonna show you. This is mono legato. And this is mono. Now, if you haven't noticed, the mono legato doesn't treat overlapping notes as separate notes. Unless, uh, unless you release all notes, uh, these are treated like a one note. So all the envelopes are not restarted. They are starting here. Our volume envelope is turning this volume down as the note plays. So it's quieter. Uh, it's getting quieter with time. If we turn this to mono, the envelope gets restarted every time a new note strikes, even though it overlaps with the previous one, so there is no gap. If there was a gap, mono legato would play, play the same thing as mono. However, with this, they are different. So this is mono legato. There is also portamento. Portamento, or so glissando or glide, is gentle changing frequency between notes. Simple as that. You can control the key limit of this. So, uh, actually, there's a limit. We have this set to three. So, notes that are <laughs> that are apart in frequency, in pitch, more than three keys are not going to be portamented, portamentoed, glided. You see? We have one key difference, two key difference, three key difference. Four. Hmm, it's still portamento. Why? I'm not sure. Actually, this is a little bit complicated. <laughs> it's true. Even I don't know everything about Zenit sub FX. Really. I'm trying to figure it out for years. But it's so amazing that still I don't know what some things do. We have portamento controls here. Accessible through the controllers button. So here's the threshold minimum or maximum difference of the notes in order to do the portamento. Multiple 10, uh, 100 cents. By the way, I was mistaken all my life. I thought 100 cents is a whole tone. It's not, uh, it's not a whole tone. It's a half tone. 50 cents, it's not a half tone. It's a quarter tone. Amazing. But I'm still learning. All right, so we have time, portamento time. I'm going to loop this. If we turn this down, there's also a thing that stretches this. If we turn this left, the rising portamento is faster than the falling one. And the opposite as well. Here we can disable the change the threshold type. When this is disabled, this is the maximum difference. When is this enabled, this is the minimum. It's a little bit of simulation of how would you play notes on a guitar. When they are far apart, you would actually switch the string. So you wouldn't uh, slide your finger on the same string and you wouldn't produce a glide effect. All right. I'm making this much too long. I shouldn't elaborate so much. <sighs> Actually, I should leave you the time to, to discover all this shit. We have pitch wheel, uh, range. Now it's a uh, half tone. 
half tone up and half of tone down you can make this much more actually I don't know how much more it can be done how high it can get six thousand sixty four hundred half tones sixty four half tones that's twenty four tones that's two octaves something like that never mind okay you can figure it out all by yourself I'm not going to spend the whole day explaining this because you know we will never get to the kick drum okay what do we have here minimum keyboard maximum keyboard when you press a key Zen sub effects remembers what key you have pressed last when you press the little M here it will input here the MIDI note number that was last pressed if you press the big M it will do the same for the max so now our instrument is only listening to the one note you see the other note wouldn't play this is nice because you can split your keyboard across these 16 instruments and you can play actually six, three different, 16 different instruments on one keyboard actually even more because you can have kits and you can actually have thousands of them and this big nice air button sets them back to 0 and 127 which are the maximum values is the whole MIDI keyboard range uh, as you probably know a piano keyboard has 88 keys MIDI supports 127 which is a bit more which is good you never can have too many keys all right of course we have a note on thing I don't know why it's it on because when it's off the instrument simply won't play anything it will never start any note so you better want this on <laughs> it's like graphics on and off all right now we have two system effects what's that huh uh, this gives links us back to the middle pane now this pane oh yes this one here with the big no effect button actually it's not a button but it looks like a button this is the effect track we have two types of effects system effects which are really really send effects and insertion effects which are insertion effects as well uh, uh, not as well really they are really insertion effects how do they differ well you can figure it out by yourself but if you don't know then we can send them out like routing the first one to the second one, routing the first one to the third one, fourth one, and so on. You can cascade these. Actually, it's useful if you want a consistent reverb patch. You can just have it. Now this, you can have four effects for all patches available and every part has its two system effects four knobs so you can send any patch to any of these four in any amount this is a reverb patch now how is it different than an insertion effect well system effects are somewhere and you're sending your um, you're sending your signal copied you're sending a copy of your signal to the insist to the system to the send effect and you're still playing back the original signal so we'll never get an all wet reverb with this you will always have the original signal present in the master channel however with insertion effects you actually route the original signal through the effect and you can have it all wet as you can see with system effects we have a volume knob here however the version of insert the version of this reverb 
meant for insertion effects have dry wet knob here which means dry is no change wet is all change and somewhere between is the mix between not processed and processed signal you can have the same thing with distortion and you can same the same you can have the same thing with distortion here and the volume knobs became dry wet knob when you change this effect to insertion effect I'm not going to talk about insertion and send effects more because we don't have the time. We need to get this done. But you can have eight of insertion effects. You can also copy them, paste them, switch them to any part you want or to master channel. So you can apply them to all after summing them up. I'm actually going to disable these because I don't know what they will do. I don't want them. Yeah, so this is it. I think we have the main window covered. Phew! I don't know about you, but I would take a little break. But no, let's get on. You can always press pause, make a few push-ups and get back. All right, so now let's get to the <laughs> file settings no I'm kidding your system stuff you can change your keyboard out layout here if you're using a different one and it's playing incorrectly you can change it you have preset files here directories and such okay now edit instrument I'm going to start up with subsynth and I'm not going to make any sounds because we'll be doing this all the way through the course, through the entire series of videos. I'm going just to explain what everything does so we can understand why these windows look like this and what they do, so you're not getting lost. As you can see, we have very nicely drawn sections in this window. We have an amplitude section and a bandwidth sec section, a frequency section, and a filter section, which is by default disabled and you can enable it. Amplitude, of course, it's loudness. Now we have amplitude pain, amplitude envelope pain. What is an envelope? Oh, if you don't know what is an envelope, man. This is ADSR. Actually, this is ADSR, with sustain on the third point. The volume rises for a given period of time, it falls for a given period of time, and stops falling on a given level, and then, when you release the key, it releases gently to nothing. This is a basic simulation. Uh, and it enables you to do many different things. But actually, Zenith of FX has this cool thing, which is free mode. So you can actually add as many points as you freaking want and do as wicked envelopes as you want. See, now I'm going to disable this. Let's get back to default. All right, so envelope, you know what's an envelope now. We have different envelopes. We have an envelope for bandwidth. We have an envelope for frequency. We have an envelope for filter. Now you know, every envelope has attack. ADSR envelope has an attack value. They are slightly different. Some don't have attack value because they always start on zero. And this is true for amplitude. However, it's not true for bandwidth or filter. You know, a vo volume amplitude envelope would always have a tech value to zero. So the note starts from silence and you can change the amount of time it takes to reach a given level. Now we have decay value. This is slightly different because uh, here 
amplitude envelope always reaches the top of the scale. And we have no such thing as decay value. We have sustain value. Ah, this is a little bit different, but envelopes are envelopes. So not, env or not, on elv not all envelopes are the same, but they are similar. So envelopes. Now we have something like a filter. Filter. This is a filter pane. As you can see, they have also different colors. So the envelopes have kind of a blue color, while filters have kind of a green color. I'm going to check and see if this is the same with other things. Yes. Yes. Filter panes are always green. However, envelopes and LFOs are always blue. So this is AdSynth. I'm not going to talk about AdSynth soon. Uh, not now. <sighs> I told about making short videos, huh? <laughs> I hope somebody, um, some of you will appreciate this because actually no one ever does this. And many of us are you know, lost trying to figure out what Zenith SubFX does by themselves and actually giving up. Eventually giving up. So I wanted to make some, you know, detailed rock solid overview so you can just, if you need it, you can just watch through this and you will know. And you will never get lost in this synth. Cool. So we have envelopes. Now we have Pains, different pains. Amplitude, of course, is loudness. Bandwidth, it's how much do you pass through. Subsynth generates white noise and filters out musical frequencies. With zero bandwidth, it sounds almost. It's a little bit quiet. I'm going to turn it up. We have enabled amplitude uh, envelope, bandwidth envelope. Also, there's a frequency. And filter. Types of filters. This is a entire different topic. Low pass filter, high pass filter, band pass filter, notch filter, peak filter, low shelf filter, high shelf filter. Read the abbreviations. Types 1 are non resonant, so they are gentle and will never produce a sharp, itchy sound. However, types 2 are resonant and they respond to Q and they create. They can create acidic, painful sounds. Yeah, this is it. <sighs> okay, of course you can uh, change the frequency, you can detune this. There's no reset button, so if you mess with this knob or slider, you just have to find the sweet spot zero. This is in cents. So actually, I'm not even reaching um, half tone. However, you have detune type and it's L33 cents. It's logarithmic, I guess. And E like equal. Maybe not. To have 1200 is actually half an octave. Something like that. Actually, you can select a range of the detune here. And the right mouse button makes it easier to n make precise changes. The 440 hertz uh, disables listening to notes. So actually, if you dis if you enable this, 
no matter what note is played, the pitch is independent. If this knob is set to a left. I guess 64 is how it behaves when you turn this off. Yes, almost. If we overshoot this, we get like two octaves for one octave, etc. We can of course have set this in octaves using this too. This course detune is a bit strange. It's not uh, balanced in octaves and it's using this detune type. But it does what it says, it's detuning, it's not shifting. However, if you do 12 or 24, you can get an octave out of this. If you set this to E100 cents. Whew. Okay. Let's not spend too much time on this. Stereo. Mono. Simple enough. Filter stages. These are the filters we have here. This is the volume. This is the width. So actually you can... Input here up to 64 harmonics. So it's the fundamental, the first harmonic, the second, third, and so on. Or you can say the first partial, the second partial, the third, fourth, and second, etc. So we can modulate, you can actually model any waveform if you know what are the proportions are. However, it's rather used for modeling noise, shaping noise. Nice sounds. And you can shift the width, just as the tooltip says. However, what the tooltip says... Hello. Harmonics bandwidth. Harmonics magnitude. This is it. You can also set clear. It resets only these settings. So this pane, magnitude type. Linear gives you the less precision. If you get this, the more negative decibels you get. The more precision you have. Actually, it strangely dies out below this level. Never mind. Also, there's a random start. Zero. Zero means that there is no click at the beginning. Uh, what's happening? Hello. Yes, zero means there's no click, but also it can produce notes that have, you know, fade in, long fade in. Random means the initial level is random. You never know where you can get a click, how loud is the click, etc. Max. Always start at max. So the waveform, the waveform. The waveform looks like this. So you're getting some initial energy. Uh, that gets you, gives you a click. The zero tries to always start the waveform here. Actually, it does it, but, but it also makes that the waveform is quieter at the beginning. And it also, it's just, you know, and random starts it out here, or here, or here, 
or here, you never know. So I most of the time use zero or max. Okay, I think we're done. <sighs> this is the pains. What more? Well, there is AdSynth. I'm not going to make sounds with it, I'm just going to show you the parts. We have amplitude envelopes, of course, amplitude. We have pain, we have new things, which are LFOs. LFOs, low frequency oscillators. They are modulating the sound with a sine wave or a triangle wave or square wave. We're going to do this later. So LFO has frequency, of course, how fast is this going? Is it wah 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 or is it wah 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 or is it wah? Depth is how much of the modulation is being done. So is it wow wow or is it wow? Start is the phase. Leftmost is random. So if you turn this all the way down, actually if it turn it below one, here's the hint. So 0.95 will also be counted as random. I've tried this, trust me. The same is with pan. You have a option to make random pan. Leftmost it's random. Actually, not only leftmost. Now, 1.02 or everything below, everything above 1 will not be random but everything below one will be random. So keep this in mind. Of course we have the stereo, here we can monophonize everything. We have envelopes for filters, filters parameters, LFOs for filters, LFOs for frequency, etc. And now this is the main window for AdSynth. Also, a cool thing is resonance. We have this cool window. We can enable this and draw a frequency response chart. Now we have oct, which is octaves. This is how wide is this. And course frequency is shifting this in, in frequency. How to read this thing? You can zero, zero it or we can smooth it. This is cool. There are also three random generators. Random 1, random 2, random 3. We can random 3 and smooth. Do some manual changes and smooth. Mm. What this does, it tries to create resonances. If you're using oscillators, it will make a little bit more natural sound because everything has a every acoustic instrument has a resonating box that favorizes some frequencies over some so it's never it's never flat when i will when i was modeling a um violin sound i really looked into this chart and i modeled how a real violin body resonates and this helped me out make this sound really like a violin I later did the same with equalizer but this also can help there's an option to protect the first fundamental frequency fundamental frequency so it's never dampened by this anyway cool stuff but very uh, very um, well strange. How to read this chart? By the way, you have 100, which is this big line, you have 500, which is this dot line, which you have 1000, 1 kilohertz, you have 5 kilohertz, you have 10 kilohertz, 20 kilohertz is here. So every line is another digit. So this is 100, uh, this is 200 hertz, 300 hertz, 400 hertz. Actually, I have shifted down. It should be a little bit longer, you know, because we should also have like 10 hertz, 50 hertz, and such. But you get the idea. We're going to get to that back to this sometime 
when we're going to talk about equalization. Okay. What do we have here? Show voice list. This is like an internal mixer just for AdSynth. AdSynth has eight voices. You can control the volume, see the waveform, change pan, disable it, detune it, change the vibrato depth. Never use that thing, but anyway. Now we have show voice parameters, and this is the bigger window. Whoops. Give me a that window. I don't know if it fits in the screen. Probably not. So this is a little bit similar to the parts we had in the main Zenit SubFX interface. We have here current voice. We have the switch. We can, you know, just go from the first to the eighth. And we have amplitude, filter, frequency, same old stuff. We have oscillator. Oscillators are kick-ass in Zenit SubFX. Here is the button change, which opens up this dialog, which kicks ass even more. And you can first select a base waveform. We have sine wave, we have triangle wave, we have pulse wave, which can be, you know, changed the pulse width. And we see the frequency chart, the partials, harmonics series of this particular waveform. And here we have a composite. Here's the basic waveform and here is the effect of multiplying this waveform by this chart of harmonics and their phase offsets. As you can see, we're shifting this in phase. So this is the basic one. It's 360. Now, if I turn this off and turn this one on, we have two cycles and we can shift this also. So we have so wave. Every wave has parameters. You have a Gaussian wave. I like to frequency modulate with this wave. Makes some nice clicky thing. Square wave that can be rounded to sine. Chirp, which is very cool and very complicated waveform. Chebyshev, which is also a nice strange waveform with very interesting frequency response. And so on. There are tons of things you can do here can use this this what we you have here as a base waveform and it actually resets these sliders so we can do some extra combinations use as base again and this copies this into this and we can have another go you know like multiplying this waveform again again use as base etc i wonder how does it sound like Very nice, probably because of a Lopez filter. If you can believe it, we have distortion here. You can distort the waveform of oscillator itself. You have, this is the b very ATEN, I don't know if what is the acronym. Quants is quantization. And this actually, you know, works like a decimator a bit. It's decimating in bit depth without um, without of course dithering so it's creating low fee nice electronic stuff there are thousands of things you can do with this you have a filter you can filter out just the waveform before you even modulate it with FM or before you apply any um, any filtering you have also a modulator modulation rev reverse kind of stuff it's reflecting don't know what is this strange sign 
you know, it's tons of stuff to experiment with. Spatial adjustment. Yeah. Base function modulation. Oh my god. Okay, I'm gonna leave you some uh, room for experimentation. How oh, we can hear that we have random panorama, pan, random panning on, yes, here in the global parameters of the instrument. Okay, so that was the oscillator. The synth is amazing. Now, what we can do here, we have also the master phase offset. This is cool if you want just to have a, let's clear this, clear, clear the harmonic settings, yes, oh no. Sign. Convert to sign? Yes. What convert to sign does? Uh, I'm going to clear. Oh my god. <laughs> How to reset this thing? Oh. Clear. Okay. So if you want to just make rid, get rid of everything, use convert to sine wave and then clear. Now, what does convert to sine wave does? If we have a pulse wave, uh, you can see this harmonic series here. We can convert this to sine wave. I'm going to click it, say yes, and you can see that it changed the base function to sine wave, which is just one fundamental frequency. However, it it set our faders here, our um, harmonics levels and phase offsets also, if we use a different waveform, to model the square wave we had. And if you look at this, this is really how a square wave looks in real life. If you haven't watched a video by Xiv.org titled Digital Show and Tell, I'm going to say go watch that thing. It's worth it too. <laughs> You're going to understand how digital sound works and why it's perfect. And why actually no sound is perfect, even if it looks like it's perfect. Like this looks like a perfect wave. But really our sound system truncates the harmonics with a Lopez filter and we actually get something like this with these ripples here and this is just what this does it also has ripples so everything can be made of pure tones this is the conclusion all right leave it oh, I can cut, talk for hours about this now we have a nice switch use oscillator internal if we open up another voice we can have internal or external one and this is the first thing of course it omits the phase offset so here we have this in phase the first one is a little bit offset we can this way you know just link it if we make a change here it will change in the second voice as well cool also we can change this to noise it doesn't display as a waveform because it's just pointless. It's white noise, white noise. White noise is very useful, but we're going to go for it when I'm going to be talking about snare drum, hi-hat, and such stuff. All right. Uh, white noise disables quite a lot of things. You can't change the frequency of the white noise. You can't modulate the white noise, and you can't do unison with the white noise. However, you can filter it and you can amplitude modulate it. You can use amplitude envelope for noise and amplitude LFO for noise. It makes sense. Modulating, frequency modulating and, and noise doesn't make sense. And playing in unison doesn't make sense too. Well, it would, but it would be hard to do. What unison does is it duplicates the sound. It makes several instances. This is a little bit loud. I'm going to turn it down. <laughs> Didn't help. Even more. Oh, I have a second thing here. 
No unison. I'm going to disable the random panorama. Okay. It duplicates the first voice, change its frequency a bit, depending on the spread, and spreads them in stereo. Don't cross 100 cents if you don't want some very detuned stuff. There's also vibrato and vibrato speed. You can also invert some part of these. Half, one-third, one-fourth, one-fifth. Or a random. Figure out why. <laughs> and we have modulation. So we have the power of the modulation, depth, the velocity sensing. So how much this changes this. Frequency dumping. Actually, I don't know how does it work. We have a envelope for power of modulator. And we have its frequency. We can detune the... the base the modulating oscillator we can change this wave form to just say if you transpose this low enough we're actually getting some wicked LFO effects and this is cool because you can actually can actually do some stuff that is impossible to do with LFO, frequency LFO. I'm now enabling an enable envelope. This is not possible to do with LFO, but you can do it with frequency modulation. So this is some R2D2 type of sound. Okay. You can also copy, copy to clipboard, switch to any part, paste paste from clipboard. You can duplicate your voices like this, so you can face offset them, detune them a bit, change the pan, change the filtering, and so on. And you get a wider, deeper, better sound. Okay, this concludes uh, my AdSynth overview. I'm going to do a very quick overview of PadSynth and we will finish this video. PadSynth generates samples. Uh, Paul Nasca, who created this synth, have invented a method of generating samples that was also invented by, invented by, by someone else and they call this Fourier synthesis. Some call this. I'm not I don't know if it's really the same or whatever. Just, I'm not into the technical details. However, it creates some nice sounds that are a little bit like uh, what Subsynth does. But you can do this with Subsynth. And also Subsynth doesn't have any LFOs. Happy exploring. Thanks for watching. I hope you've learned something. Actually, quite a lot of things. And, well, I hope to see you on this channel. I want to record an episode 
like one episode a week, maybe more, maybe less. We will see. If you want to know, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, I'm gonna play some jingle. Huh. Yeah. So, thanks for watching. See you again. Bye.